So let's just clarify one thing here. So if somebody comes up and hits you, you're just supposed to say, hit me again? It, well, let, let, let's read the verse that was alluded to in Matthew 5. You see, this is where um, studying the Scripture together can be very helpful, right? Because when you read uh, Matthew 5.39... I'm reading it out of the uh, older New American Standard Bible. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is where certain uh, groups have become what is known as pacifists. Pacifists think that you should, not, you should not protect yourself. You should not... I heard somebody one time from the pulpit, from a pulpit... <laughs> say that if someone came in to do harm to his family, he would sit and let them do it. Matthew 5, 39 does not teach pacifism. If you study it in its history, there, there is a common phrase. We don't know how old it is. It is found in rabbinic literature, but it's found earlier as well. To slap on the cheek means to insult you. It's not a physical slap. It's a way of saying, oh, you know, you insulted me. If someone insults you, let him insult you again. In other words, don't harm him. Don't, don't say bad against him. Don't um, uh, commit Lashon Hara, evil speech against him to other people, gossip. Okay, God will take care of your reputation as long as you're living the way you should. No, you can... You can try to correct him, say, no, I didn't say that, I didn't do that, why are you saying that about me, or whatever. But ultimately, um, it's talking about being defamed. It's talking about being put down by others. We don't have to go out and take a, uh, you know, um, an advertisement saying, whoever's telling this about me, it isn't true, da 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 We don't have to do that. The, our life of, of, of holiness will speak for itself amongst those who truly know us. So, does the scripture say to defend yourself? Why did God tell in Yeshua, why did Yeshua tell the disciples when they went out the second time to take a sword with them? Right? They're not only supposed to take a pocketbook with something in it, but they're to, take, they're to have a sword too. There's nothing wrong with self-defense. Brothers and sisters, if someone breaks into the house to do you harm, do all that you possibly can do to restrain them. Make sure you um, call officials first. We have a nice way of doing that, 911, right? <laughs> call and say there's trouble here, and, and, uh, but do what you can to protect and to save life. Life is sacred. And pray to the Lord of Armies, and he may actually say to you, Go get your weapon. I'll help you use it. When Israel went out to battle, they didn't go out without weapons. Right? They went out with weapons. He just said, I will, I will subdue the enemy before you. Do you suppose that there were Israelites who were lost in the battle? Yes. yes. It, if you, if you the take the Luke Romans passage and other passages, it's talking about a brother, someone. And... Uh, it, it also says, if you know that you have something against your brother, or you owe your brother something, and you're on the way to the house of praise, leave your gift, go get it right, and then come back. In other words, don't bring strife into the community. You go, go get it taken care of, you know, and, but that's talking about someone that is within your community, right? Now... Are we supposed to show loving uh, God's love to those outside of our community too? Of course, absolutely. Life is sacred. So regardless of who it may be, we are to act uh, righteously toward them. But if someone is seeking to do me harm or seeking to do you harm and I have the ability to, to stop that person, then we should do that. That's just what God intends. He does not intend to allow evil to go its way. I see a hand back here. Kit, I don't know where the microphone is. Oh.
Testing. Okay. My question is, um, so you're saying that it may be a Hebrew euphemism or an ancient euphemism that it's if someone we, slaps you on the cheek... It's, it's what a, we call an idiom. Or idiom. Yeah. It's now, a, for instance, when you say, you know, some, if somebody asks, this is an example, somebody says, how was your week? He says, oh man, it was like there was a rock in my shoe. What's a rock in your shoe? Something that bothers you and bothers you. Did you really have a rock in your shoe? No. Did you know about my week? <laughs> you, use an, you use an expression that is well known in the culture to talk about, to, to, to compile a, a larger explanation into one expression. That's what we call an idiom. Okay. So, so this so, idiom so, would have um, a reference of disrespect right, or right. Um, slander. What's or, the ultimate insult? In, an, in, in one culture, an ultimate insult is to be slapped in the face. Or spit in the face. Or spit in the face. Right. Well, in the ancient world, to get slapped in the face in public was meant you were really being insulted. <laughs> At least that's one uh, uh, option in terms of interpreting that phrase. There, there is, if we take, now, okay, here's a basic reality. <clears throat> I, I hope you agree with me on this. If you don't, we can talk later. All scripture is inspired by God. Mm -hmm. From that we derive, when it says all scripture, we believe that that includes the apostolic scriptures, which we derive from that principle, this, that there is ultimately no absolute discontinuity within the scriptures. In other mm -hmm. words, the scriptures are not self-contradictory. That means when we find something that appears to be contradictory, we need to seek further to see how the scriptures resolve that, okay? So David, when you read the Psalms, one thing you need to keep in mind is that, granted, he is talking as an individual, but who does he represent? Israel. Israel, he's the king. Mm -hmm. When he says, subdue my enemies, what does that mean? The Philistines. <laughs> it's not just the guy around the corner that he doesn't like. It's talking about an, in a national entity, okay? So, when you go out to battle, what David is saying, when we go out to battle, the Lord goes with us, just as we read in our, in our portion today. The Lord goes with us. Therefore, we trust Him. We wait for Him to give us the victory. Does that mean we stand there and just wait for Him to, to uh, subdue the enemy? No. What does it mean? Take up your sword, go fight, and God will give you the victory. We, we could hear Ezra in modern days. I'm being a little facetious here. Okay. But we could hear Ezra praying, if he was in modern times, Oh Lord, just build this, just build this wall. We're just going to sit here and wait for you to do it. Hmm. A lot of modern Christianity simply says, God will do it. I don't have to do anything. Oh God, make me holy. Well, how does God make you holy? By hating sin, by subduing the flesh, by saying no to the things you know are are wrong and yes to the things that are right. It is a cooperation. Right? So we have the same thing going on in the scriptures across the board. Now, are there some things that we cannot do that God, you know, uh, will do for us? Absolutely. Now, I'd like to use Dagmar's testimony of, 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 uh, of praise uh, today as an example of that. She could have prayed, which I'm glad she didn't, she could have prayed, Lord, just miraculously put my keys back in my purse and just keep waiting to open to see if it was there. No, what did she do instead? She went looking for them. She went asking for them. Now, as she was giving her testimony of praise, I thought to myself, I wonder if somebody found those keys and thought, hmm, I'll just toss them in the trash can. Or, oh, I collect keys. There are some people that do, mm -hmm. right? Wow, I found some keys. You suppose if that were the case that God might have at that point, I'm just doing a might have, prompted that person say, no, you go turn those in. And he's kind of like, yeah, I better turn these in. So God was working on behalf of his child in order to answer her prayers. But she still went and looked and found them. That's the way it is throughout the scriptures. We shouldn't think that if we just open up our Bible, put it underneath the pillow, sleep on it, that it's all going to just osmosis into our brains. Yeah. <laughs> of course, osmosis is the travel of 
molecules from a more dense to a less dense uh, area. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Maybe that says something about the brain. <laughs> okay. Okay. By the way, that's uh, J. Vernon McGee exposits it much the same way. Like, it's like praying for, are we praying for the police and the fire department to do a good job to stop evil with um, any means that they're... Yeah. And it's, he's praying not for, like he's a corp, he's praying for Israel corporately. Yes. Mainly and... Uh, right. And the, there's no reason why there can't yeah. be some of that related to uh, uh, individually. But yeah. we still must take, uh, we must still take the responsibility to do what the Lord mm -hmm. has enabled to do and given us commandment to do. Mm -hmm. We can't expect him to bless us if we're not walking according to his commandments, right? Yeah. So there is a sense in which there's a partnership. And now you got me a little bit on a tangent here. But this is oh. the difference between justification and sanctification, okay? Mm -hmm. The two are intricately bound together. Sanctification flows out of justification, right? But let me explain very quickly according to what the scriptures say. Justification is God working alone upon someone who would not seek him and who would not say yes to him. He endows that, he, he you know, unless, he says, Yeshua says, unless the Father draws them, they will not come. Right? Paul says, there is none who seek after God, there is no not one. So how is anybody going to come to salvation? God, in, in, in a special way, maybe different for every person, is going to draw them to himself. Okay? He's working. How much, per, how much work does a dead person do? No. And are we dead in our trespasses and sins before we come to faith? Yes. All right. Yes. Then God must work on his own to bring us to himself and to bring us to life, to regenerate us, right? That's God working. He declares us to be righteous. He says, I will treat you as righteous because that's what I'm going to make you. That's God working alone. We call it monergism, one person working. But once we have been born again, born anew, now we are given this indwelled spirit. The spirit indwells us. That's, that's a, a very difficult thing to, to consider. That God himself dwells within us and with us. Now, we have the ability to say no to God. Right? We can grieve the spirit of God. So what are we to do as the reborn person? We are to train ourselves in righteousness to put down the deeds of the flesh. In fact, Paul uses a very strong term, put to death the deeds of the flesh. And we're to say yes. And, and the more that we do that, the more we realize this is life as it's supposed to be. When we say yes to God, it doesn't mean that the path gets easier but it means that he gives us the ability to walk the path. And when we're done and we look back at that hill we just climbed up and we say, God, without you I could do nothing. I bless you, Lord, for that. Thank you for helping me move this direction. Thank you for helping me get this done. And then he blesses us more. He says, see, <laughs> when we work together, great things happen. Now, whom the Father loves, he disciplines. Right? Right? So when we say no to him, he gives us heartburn, right? There's things that we say, no, that's, oh, wow, now I understand why this has happened. This is, the, this is the role of sanctification. It's a working together with God. God is a God of relationship. He's not an engineer that just pushes buttons. He is a God of relationship. And he walks with us. And he communicates with us. And he gives us his word. And we communicate to, with him through prayer. And through praise. So that's. When that gets confused. I, I've heard this recently. Just rely and relax. Let God do it. Just get out of the way. God will take care of it. No. That's not what he says. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say rely and relax. Now it does say to trust in the Lord, right? But it says, you fight, you wrestle, 
You put on the armor of God. You engage the battle. And God will strengthen you for the victory. And sometimes the victory is something in the future, right? Sometimes we don't always see the victory right away. Mike, do you have something else to say? Just in closing, we're commanded to fight and walk, and that was very well spoken. But I said before, the kicker is God gets all the credit. Absolutely. The Absolutely. So, I don't mind giving it to him either. You know, l let me use this illustration while we're on that, uh, on that topic. H how many of you learned to swim when you were a little kid? A lot of you. Any of you learned to swim, when, but you didn't learn to swim until you were an adult? Any? Any adults? Okay. I remember when uh, the lifeguard at summer camp was teaching me how to swim. And he put his hand, arms out like this, and I laid on my back. And then he walked down into the pool, and then he said, I'm just going to let you down. Now, just a little, little, just hold your breath. Just hold your breath. And I started to sink, and water got into my nose, and I started rolling around, and I kept going down. He pulled me back up. He said, no, 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 no. You just have to relax. Work hard to relax. Right? And I remember thinking later on in my life, as I was trying to put together this question of justification and sanctification, oh, trusting the Lord is something I have to do. I have to keep resisting the flesh. I have to keep resisting, saying, no, Lord, I am not going to worry about this. I'm not going to concern myself because there's nothing I can do. I've done everything I possibly can do. It's now in your hands. I'm going to continue to say, I trust you. And when my flesh says, oh, Tim, you really ought to worry about this. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I say, no, forget it. This one's up to the Lord. It's a lot of work to relax. So, yes, he wants to partner with us, and he has partnered with us. And that's how we grow in the wisdom, the knowledge, the grace of God. Yes, uh, we have a hand up here. Uh, uh, Judah, yeah. Okay, so all that comes to this. Some of you, I hope you all would agree with me, but some of you may not like this. Theology really is important. Because theology is just knowing the truth that God has revealed in His Word. It literally means the teaching about God. That's what the word theology means. And theology is important. We live in an era where, no, where it's, not, it's not right to make distinctions between right and wrong when it comes in theology. Now, I know there are some areas we can't be dogmatic about because we don't have enough information. Okay, But there are some areas we can be dogmatic about. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing because this is long, and I see you all fanning. Well, not all of you, some of you. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to make it any longer than it needs to be. The first part of my handout here talks about a doctrine or a theology called the priesthood of believers. Okay? Did you notice in our Torah portion that, we talk, that it taught about the priests? What were some of the things that the Torah portion told us? The priest did not have an inheritance in the land. Is that fair? Aren't they, aren't they part of the tribe of Levi? Then shouldn't they have inheritance in the land? Why is that that God put down in his Torah? What do we learn? What's the principle that we learn from that? Here's the principle. The principle is that those who are leaders in religious areas or, the, or, or in terms of uh, the communities walk with the Lord, those who are leaders and teachers ought not to get wealthy on their leading and teaching. On the other hand, you'll read in the handout that I've done, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be cared for. Even the priests were cared for. Okay, They received some of the gifts that the people brought in and so forth. Their, their livelihood was, was cared for. Is that required of a teacher? No. Paul taught without being re remunerated, right? He said that, however, if you read it carefully, he said, I could demand of you, but I don't, because he didn't want to diminish the, the, the impact of the gospel to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would not know all of the Torah like the, his Jewish uh, friends would. So, some of us worked and taught for 10 years or more. 
you know, and then there was a blessing that came and they said, you know, we'd like you to spend most of your time doing this and we'd like to help you do that by making a living for you. And I didn't resist. At first I thought, is this what should happen? But then we <coughs> prayed and, and I said, okay. And uh, we've done that in, in, in other, in other, uh, for other people down through the years as well. So the, the, the point simply is this. Are there priests today? That's a tough question. That's a tricky question. Are there priests today? Well, the Roman Catholic priests are not really priests, are they? I guarantee you they are not the priests that we read about in our text today. You see, there was a big problem after the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple, there was a big problem for this reason. Because people, I believe, misunderstood majority, not everyone, misunderstood what actually happened in the temple. When someone brought a sacrifice, say a guilt offering, and that guilt offering was slaughtered and put upon the altar, was that what caused their sins to be forgiven? Many people think so. Many, many people thought that the Bible taught that if you don't have a Yom Kippur sacrifice, your, uh, your sins are not atoned for. There had to be a priesthood. If there weren't a priesthood, there was no way of going to God. The Roman Catholic Church was, took, that, took that doctrine and said, well, let's combine it with another theology. God, didn't get away, God did away with Israel. Now he has a new Israel, which is the church. If you don't think this was early on a theology, an errant or an error theology then just go read the Epistle of Barnabas. It's dated to 110 to 120. That's pretty early. And it says, God has forsaken the old people, I'm paraphrasing, and has now taken to himself a new people. Who are the new people? Us. The Christians. Now, if you have a new people, are there new ways of looking at things? Absolutely. Absolutely. What the old people had as physical, the new people have as non-physical. Is there a non-physical temple? Yes. And what is that? Us. Didn't Paul say we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Yes, but it's not simply that you have brick and mortar and you can, you know, everyone has the Spirit who is a believer so we're all now the temple, and especially when we come together a temple. So what sacrifices do we give? Sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of money. Oh yeah, money. Sacrifices, so forth and so on. Okay. So do we need priests? Yes. So they designate the bishops as priests. The priests take on the priestly function. Now, the Protestants, however, in the Protestant Reformation thought, no, that, that can't be right. The, the Roman Catholic Church is not the kingdom of God. The priests in the Roman Catholic Church are not true priests, but they still had a problem. The old had gone away because the Reformers believed in replacement theology. The Reformers taught that the church had replaced Israel, that the church was the new Israel. Now who's the priests? Everybody. This was born the priesthood of believers. Now, there's a sense in which the priesthood of believer theology is right. In this sense, that we all have access to God without any human being, other human being on this earth being our intercessor, right? But did that only happen after Yeshua came? No, it didn't. Hannah prayed to God right? David prayed to God. Abraham prayed to God. He didn't. Abraham didn't have a priest. The priesthood of all believers came as a result of bad theology. Replacement theology was the, one of them and the idea that the sacrifices actually atone for sin. Now, you'll say, well, I can show you where it says, and your sins will be atoned for. Yes. On what basis? 
on, on the basis that there is a forward-looking faith to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, just think through this a minute. I hope this isn't too tangled. If a sacrifice could pay for sins, there was no need for Yeshua to come. As long as you would bring your sacrifice, sins were paid for. Has there only always ever been one way of salvation? Yes. Yeshua made it very clear. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. You say, well, Tim, he's talking about people in his time and later. Oh, really? Then how come, Mo, uh, how come uh, um, Paul uses Abraham and David as his prime examples of what it means to be justified by faith in Yeshua? In Romans 4. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him or accredited to him for righteousness. So those are the two bad theologies that have spawned a whole lot of other bad theologies. And one of them is this idea of priesthood of all believers. Go to the bottom of page 2 and I'll just summarize this. Some might point to verses in Revelation to support the priesthood of all believers. I've given you the references there. The first two references, however, are most likely dependent upon Exodus 19.6 and carry the same message, namely, that those who remain steadfast in their faith represent the nation, that is Israel, that is to be defined by the service of the priests and their duties before the Lord. When it says that Israel is a nation of priests, does it mean everyone in Israel is a priest? No. We see this very clearly in the Torah. If a, if, if a non-priest approaches the altar, what's to happen to that person? They die. Okay, so there were a clear distinction. We'll explain why in a minute. Okay, so what does it mean that Israel was a nation of priests? It was a nation represented by priests. It was a nation that was characterized by a priesthood that stood between the common person and God and acted as an intercessor. For what reason? To show us ultimately what the final and ultimate intercessor would be doing. What would he be doing? He would be taking the blood of the sacrifice into the most holy place. Where's the most holy place not made with hands? Heaven. Which is why it was required. Yeshua said in John 14, I must go. Why must you? Just set up the kingdom now. Oh no. There has to be intercession. Uh, an applying, as it were, of his, of his blood at the very throne of the Father on your behalf and my behalf. And, you, and the writer to the Hebrews says that he always lives to make intercession for us. Um, what are the ramifications if, as I have suggested, the doctrine of priesthood of all believers is not, in fact, a biblical doctrine? And I'm not in any way saying that we don't have full access to the Father and always have. That's not what I'm saying. But we do not function as priests. That one song that we sing occasionally, I don't know, it says, take me into the Holy of Holies, take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Um, I wish it were worded differently. You know, t how do I go in before the Father? In Yeshua. How do I have access to the Father? In Yeshua. Apart from Yeshua, I have no access to the Father. He is our heavenly high priest. That's the bulk of the book of Hebrews. So, First, we should affirm that at least part of the motivation for this doctrine was right on the mark, namely that each believer in Hashem has direct access to the Father through the Messiah. But this has always been the case. Consider Hannah, David, Daniel, Joel, Habakkuk, and others mentioned in the Tanakh. All people who, not being Levitical priests, had ready access to the Father through their prayers. Think of your prayers as a privilege. What is more, for those who exercise saving faith in the promised Messiah, their faith is demonstrated when they brought their sacrifices to the priests, whether in the tabernacle or temple. For in the dramatization of the sacrifice, they awaited and looked forward to the coming land of God, Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. I have been somewhat mocked for making that statement. Um, in, a, in a seminar some years ago, somebody raised their hand and said, do you really honestly believe that Old Testament believers looked ahead and, and put their faith in Yeshua? I said, yes, I have no other option than to believe that. They said, how could you believe that? I said, because Paul says that Abraham and David were justified by faith. And 
I know Abraham didn't stay silent about it, and I'm, I know for certain David didn't because he was a musician, and musicians can't stay quiet about anything. <laughs> so, you know, he was singing it. He was teaching all of this to, to the people. Secondly, however, and perhaps most importantly, a realization that I am not, in fact, a priest in the sense of having access to the most holy place for atonement. It leaves me in dire need of a priest. This means that my only access to the Father is in reality through the high priest Yeshua. Apart from him, I have no entrance into the most holy place, which is why it has become the habit to pray in the name of Yeshua. What does that mean? By means of his intercession. And sometimes we don't know how to pray as we want. We say, Lord, I don't even know what to ask. I don't know even how to, how to, how to pray in this situation. And what does the scripture say? It's okay. The Spirit will take your groanings and your utterings and bring them to the Lord in a way that is acceptable and right. Thus, I am fully dependent upon Him for access to the Father, and therefore praying in the name of Yeshua takes on an extremely significant value. For each time I evoke the name of Messiah in my prayer, I confess that apart from Him I have no way to the Lord. Thirdly, and here's what Jeannie was asking, a realization that the priesthood of all believers doctrine is not biblical, biblically based, does away with the problem of a reinstated Levitical priesthood in the millennium. Boy, this is, a, this is a hard one for the Christian church. This is why, by the way, from my readings, some of the great theologians gave up on a future millennium and became amillennial. They said, there's no way. If you allow the temple to be reinstated, if you allow the priesthood to be reinstated, you have undone the new covenant. Why? Because they were teaching the new covenant did away with the Torah. At least they're consistent. Since the Levitical priesthood was always a visual aid or foreshadowing of the ultimate Melchizedekian priesthood in Yeshua, the return of the Levitical priest as a necessary part of temple worship in no way contradicts the work of Yeshua as our high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. In this regard, it is interesting to note that in Ezekiel's description of the millennial temple, in Ezekiel 40 through 48, he never speaks of a Kohen Gadol, a high priest. You never read about the high priest in Ezekiel, but constantly refers to the prince, the Nasi, as the one who carries out the functions of the Kohen. So, Jeannie, your question, how will, the, how, how will the Levitical priesthood be reinstated? Well, I can tell you, I know this for certain, that this is at least one way possible. Yeshua knows who's a Levite and not. He knows it all. Right? Has he promised to maintain every tribe in, of Israel? Yeah. He said, you will not be blotted off the face of the earth. So there are people today, and ultimately there will be people in the millennium whenever that happens, whom God will know, Yeshua will know, that they are Levitical. And he will, and he will appoint them. But what will be the purpose? The purpose will be, I, mean, I like to ask people this question when we're discussing this issue of theology. And when they say, well, if the, if the temple is reinstated in a millennium, then that does away with the, the new covenant. I say, why? You don't think Abraham was part of the new covenant? You don't think David was part of the new covenant? It's our thinking that makes new time-bound and old. By the way, it's only one time ever found in the Bible that it says old covenant. You wouldn't... It, that, that, when I first, when I thought to myself years ago, I'm going to do a quick study on Old Covenant because I hear it all the time. Oh, the old, under the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant. So I went on my Bible software and put Old Covenant in there and said, what? It's only found one time? 2 Corinthians 3? Yeah, only one time. Why does everybody talk about an Old Covenant? You better find out what 2 Corinthians 3 is talking about when it uses Old Covenant because it's not exactly in any way what people com commonly think of as Old Covenant is before Yeshua came and New Covenant is after He came. Covenants, these covenants are not time-bound. Okay? And by the way, we can talk about this later, I don't think the New Covenant has been fulfilled yet. I think it is being fulfilled, but I don't think it's fulfilled yet. Which is why we must have a theology of Israel in our theologies or we're missing something ma major. Okay, so I ask people, well, why do you think that if the covenant, if the sacrifices are reinstated in the millennium, that it undermines the work of Yeshua? Wouldn't it have undermined the work of Yeshua before? 
And I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I hadn't thought about that. What did, the, what did the sacrifices do before? They pointed to Yeshua. And some would say, I had somebody say this to me, well, before you were married, did you have pictures of your, of your, your, your to-be wife, your fiancé, or your hopeful fiancé? Did you have pictures that you looked at all the time? I said, yeah. I said, you don't do that now. I said, oh, yes, I do. I got a picture of her on my desk. Pictures remind us of a time in history, some event, right? Okay? So is the sacrificial system a picture? First question, the answer is yes. Second question, was there a group of people that neglected to understand the picture? Those people would be Israel. Is God going to put the picture back up so they see it? Yeah, and who's going to be there to explain it? Yeshua. When, when, he's, when Zechariah says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced, where are they going to look upon him whom they have pierced? He's going to be there in the temple. I can just hear it now. Now do you understand? Now do you see what you missed before? And somebody's going to say, well, but their eyes were blinded. Right? Isaiah 6. So, well, now are your eyes blinded? No. Then God has been faithful to his word that he would bring about the opening of your eyes and show you the truth and take the heart of stone out and give a heart of flesh, right? And pour out upon you the Spirit of God. What has he done for us? He's done that very thing. We're first fruits. The harvest is yet to be made, but we're the first fruits. We're the first taste of what it is for God to show himself in his son Yeshua as the eternal Savior and as the one who is the sacrifice for us. He is the prince, that is. He is the prince that is to come. Now, who's the fake prince that is to come? <laughs> the anti-Messiah. And uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was, a, was kind of a uh, f uh, representative of that, right? In Daniel 9, the prince who is to come, you know, so forth and so on, and destroy the city and whatever. It's the very language that we have Ezekiel using of, I think, of the millennial temple in which the Messiah will reign. It, does this all sound too fantastic to y'all? I mean, at first it's just kind of like, wow, who came up with this story? Ah, oh, you bring us back to home. Yeah. In other words, if the first two chapters of Genesis are true, not the way the modern people are trying to morph it, okay? But God spoke and it happened. That nothing existed, John 1. Nothing existed before. And he spoke and it came into being. You know, I love I, I that. I, you know, you ask somebody, do you really believe that, that all of this happened out of nothing? It just happened? How did that happen? And they give the, these nonsense uh, responses. Well, matter is eternal. Oh, really? Is there any proof that matter is eternal? No. It's just that they know that if they say there is a creator, then they're going to have to deal with it. Right? So if God is creator and Yeshua is creator, because John 1 says that nothing exists but what he created it, Father and Son, right? The Spirit is creator because he hovered over the, over the waters. So our God is the God who spoke and it came to being. Our Savior is the one who died and on the third day came back to life. Not because anybody endowed him with life, but that he took life back on his own initiative and sovereignty. So you take the creation and you take the resurrection. And then you say, you know what? I think you better read this book again. Because if this book is his word, we better take heed to it. What do you think about our, what our text says about a false prophet? Let me ask a touchy question, but I don't, I'm not afraid to ask touchy questions. Have there been well-known teachers in the Messianic movement, whatever you want to call it, the Torah movement, who have made false prophecies? Yes. Caleb was in, my son Caleb was in Israel with one of these false prophets, and he prophesied that uh, Yeshua was coming back in 1999, just as it would maybe turn to 2000. 
And it didn't happen. And people, there were people that had followed him and left the United States and sold everything they had and went to Israel waiting for the coming of, of Yeshua as they had believed him. And they were outside the, the, the uh, place where, uh, my, where Caleb was staying and this other man was staying and others, well, a little hostile. And uh, there were people outside that wanted his neck. They were yelling and screaming and saying, you come out here and face us. And he wouldn't go out. You know that man is still teaching? You know that he's still gaining followers? He's doing pretty well financially too. And he's doing pretty well financially too. Right. There are three or four others. They continue. They should not be teaching. What does it mean in our text when it says you shall not fear? It means you should not give them any credence. You shouldn't consider them to be giving you the truth. They should be shut their mouth. Now, you say, well, what if they repent? Fine. Baruch Hashem, if they repent. But they shouldn't go back to teaching. In ancient Israel, they wouldn't have the breath to go back teaching. If you get my drift. We have to be careful. When you listen to things, when you watch things, when you see teachings on the internet or somewhere, do a little investigation. Who is the teacher? Is he or she reputable? Do they have a good reputation amongst the community and communities in which um, they, they reside. Okay. Um, that leads us to a final question, and I'll be done in five minutes. The question of whether or not Hashem, I'm on page six, is still sending prophets in our days is an interesting one. We know that in the first century congregations of the way, there were those who held the position of prophet. Now, it's different to have the gift of prophecy than hold the office of a prophet, as far as I can understand. The interpretation that these were those who simply taught the scriptures but did not disclose revelations of the future simply cannot be sustained because there's too many evidences of someone who said there's something future coming, we need to prepare for it, and it did come, it did happen. All uses of the term prophet as an office involve in one measure or another the prediction of the future based upon revelation. Now, the gift of prophecy can simply be speaking forth what the word of God has said. Okay, the gift of prophecy. But the office of a prophet is someone who not only teaches, but also gives the revelation of God which has not yet been given. Though the prophet was known for simply declaring the truth about God, he or she was also involved in disclosing the future based upon the received revelation. While some have wanted to distinguish between the prophets in the Tanakh and those read about in the apostolic scriptures, it seems that such a distinction is somewhat arbitrary. At least that's my suggestion. I do like uh, Grudem's work. I think he has a lot to commend, but I'd like to see him take it just a little bit further. I'll let you read that. So this idea that I would agree with Dr. Grudem in that prophets of the time of the, of the Tanakh as well as the time of the, of the early century, um, like we read in, in Corinthians and so forth, the, the, they differ in this. They were not writing prophets. Their works did not become scripture. So that's a significant difference. But did some prophets in the time of Yeshua and the time of the apostles, did they talk about something coming in the future and warn people and that it happened? Yes. That did happen. That We find it in the book of Acts. That's all I'm saying. We have to give credence to that. So while this explanation would, could solve the issue of how prophets were to be judged in 1 Corinthians 14, it seems to me to make too great a distinction and leave the so-called New Testament prophet without any guidelines, nor the congregation any recourse when the false prophet is identified. What is more, so my point is simply this, that if we have false prophets amongst us, we can't stone them, but we ought to treat them as though they were stoned. What is more, the fact that the Septuagint used the same Greek term, prophetes, for the ancient prophet in Israel, as in the apostolic scriptures used for the prophet in the congregation, would lead one to believe that in their minds they consider the position to have had continuity with the ancient prophets, that is, in the sense that there were cases where some prophets foretold the future for the sake of the believing community, warned them about things coming and so forth. How then should we apply our Torah text to the current day? It seems very straightforward. If someone claims to speak in the name of Hashem and proclaims that such and such will happen in the future, when the time frame expires which the prophet delineated and the prophet prophesied event has not occurred, that prophet is to be labeled a false prophet and is no longer to be revered, feared, with regard to his or her teaching. 
It seems that a great many false prophets are still actively teaching via radio, TV, and Internet who, for all practical purposes, should be entirely disregarded. Of course, in the diaspora and apart from the rule of Messiah in the land, the application of the death penalty is an impossibility. But I think we treat them as though they are no longer to be listened to. It may also be the case that the gift of prophecy in Romans 12.6 and 1 Corinthians 12.10 was given to some within the early communities of the way in order that those given the gift of prophecy would communicate God's direction for the believers of Yeshua until such time as the inspired apostolic scriptures would be written. And that's the view that I take. I think that the apostles were in the process of teaching what needed to be taught with the influx of Gentiles coming in now to the ecclesia. There were new issues, there were new problems, and they needed new instruction. How do we deal with this? And I think that was the primary role of the prophets. It says, this may be how we are to understand Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If it was something that was necessary for the ongoing body of the Messiah, I don't think Paul would have written that. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Now some take that to mean when the perfect one comes, that is Yeshua. But I think by speaking of the perfect, which is to come, here Paul may be referring to the completion of the apostolic scriptures and thus the biblical canon. In the following verses, verses 11 to 13, even the written canon of scripture is made complete by the return of Yeshua, who is the word and therefore the one by whom all things are brought to their final completion. As Paul writes in Ephesians, the summing up of all things in Messiah, things in the heavens and things on the earth. So you say, well, Tim, do you think the Bible will be expanded when Yeshua comes? I don't, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it will, be, it will be more perfectly understood. The things that we don't know and don't quite be able to put together, he will make clear to us. And the prophecies, and the prophecies, prophecies will be complete, completed, right. Having discussed the possibility of the priest and prophet, Moses goes on to recap the laws of the cities of refuge. And what does he do here? He simply, well, if you go to the last page, the land was in, in initially to be divided into three parts so that the cities of refuge were not determined with reference to population centers, but in relationship to borders and to the proximity of one to the other. In other words, they were to be sufficiently distributed throughout the land so as to make access to them more or less equal for all, regardless of where they lived in Israel. Why? Because life is sacred. When someone accidentally commits homicide, and he or she flees to the city of refuge, they need to have ready access to a place of safety. Because until things were set up in the land itself, there was, there was no hope if the avenger of blood uh, came and could take your life by law. The one eligible to flee to the city of refuge is clearly the one who has committed manslaughter, a murder which was accidental and not premeditated. By the way, it's this passage of scripture that underlies a lot of the jurisprudence in our own land about what is premeditated murder and what is first, second, third degree murder and so forth and so on. A anger against a fellow man could always be construed as motive for murder. Yeshua says, don't hate. Hate is like murder because that's where murder starts, right? Hatred. And would thus make suspect the one who claimed manslaughter. Furthermore, one would have to presume that the axe head which slipped, or the chunk of wood which slipped from the axe head, so one interpretation, was loose not by negligence, but by some other means. Remember, negligence is considered to be culpability by the Torah, right? If you have a bull that gores and you don't put that bull in a safe place and that bull goes and gores somebody, you're responsible. Or don't maintain your equipment. Like brakes? Okay. We're not advertising anybody here. Okay. The adding of three more cities is so that the innocent blood not be shed in the land. In fact, the cities of refuge are a beautiful illustration of the balance God has between desiring holiness for his people, thus allowing the avenger of blood to put a guilty murderer to death, and preserving innocent life in the midst of a fallen world where accidental injury and death will most assuredly occur. But he remembers the recipe from which we were made. What did he do? He took some dust. And he knows that until sin is entirely removed from our existence, we will deal with the sorrows and woes of life which are inevitable. Yet in spite of these inevitabilities, the Lord demands that righteousness prevail and that the innocent have their lives preserved. This also is an enduring principle that should characterize our corporate and individual lives. 